State and Revolution, Chapter 1, Class Society and the State, Section 1, The State as the Product of the Irreconcilability of Class Antagonisms. What is now happening to Marx's doctrine has, in the course of history, often happened to the doctrines of other revolutionary thinkers and leaders of oppressed classes struggling for emancipation. During the lifetime of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes have visited relentless persecution on them and received their teaching with the most savage hostility, the most furious hatred, the most ruthless campaign of lies and slanders. After their death, attempts are made to turn them into harmless icons, canonize them, and surround their names with a certain halo for the consolation of oppressed classes and with the object of duping them, while at the same time emasculating and vulgarizing the real essence of their revolutionary theories and blunting their revolutionary edge. At the present time, the bourgeoisie and the opportunists within the labor movement are cooperating in this work of adulterating Marxism. They omit, obliterate, and distort the revolutionary side of its teaching and its revolutionary soul. They push to the foreground and extol what is or seems to be acceptable to the bourgeoisie. All the social chauvinists are now Marxists, joking aside. And more and more do the German bourgeois professors, erstwhile specialists in the demolition of Marx, speak now of the, quote, national German Marx, who they aver, has educated the labor unions, which are so splendidly organized for conducting the present predatory war. In such circumstances, the distortion of Marxism being so widespread, it is our first task to resuscitate the real teachings of Marx on the state. For this purpose, it will be necessary to quote at length from the words of Marx and Engels themselves. Of course, long quotations will make the text cumbersome and will no way help make it popular reading, but we cannot possibly avoid them. All, or at any rate, all the most essential passages in the works of Marx and Engels on the subject of the state must necessarily be given as fully as possible, in order that the reader may form an independent opinion of all the views of the founders of scientific socialism and of the development of these views, and in order that their distortions by the present predominant cause Trotskyism may be proved in black and white and rendered plain to all. Let's begin with the most popular of Engels' works, On the Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Summarizing his historical analysis, Engels says, The state is therefore by no means a power imposed on society from the outside, just as little is it the reality of the moral idea, the image and reality of reason, as Hegel asserted. Rather, it is a product of society at a certain stage of development. It is the admission that this society has become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself, that it is cleft into irreconcilable antagonisms which it is powerless to dispel. But in order that these antagonisms, classes with conflicting economic interests, may not consume themselves and society in sterile struggle, a power apparently standing above society becomes necessary, whose purpose it is to moderate the conflict and keep it within the bounds of order. And this this power arising out of society, but placing itself above it and increasingly separating itself from it, is the state. That's the end of Engels' quote. Here we have expressed in all its clearness the basic idea of Marxism on the question of the historical role and meaning of the state. The state is the product of the manifestation of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. The state arises when, where, and to the extent that the class antagonisms cannot be objectively reconciled. And, conversely, the existence of the state proves that the class antagonisms are irreconcilable. It is precisely on this most important and fundamental point that the distortions of Marxism arise along two main lines. On the one hand, the bourgeois, and particularly the petty bourgeois ideologists, compelled under the pressure of indisputable historical facts to admit that the state only exists where there are class antagonisms and the class struggle, correct Marx in such a way as to make it appear that the state is an organ for reconciling the classes. According to Marx, the state could neither arise nor maintain itself if a reconciliation of classes were possible. But the petty bourgeois and Philistine professors and publicists, the state, and this frequently on on the strength of benevolent references to Marx becomes a consolator of the classes. According to Marx, the state is an organ of class domination, an organ of oppression of one class by another. Its aim is the creation of order, which legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the collisions between the classes. But in the opinion of the petty bourgeois politicians, order means reconciliation of the classes, and not oppression of one class by another. To moderate collisions does not mean, they say, to deprive the oppressed classes of certain definite means and methods of 
struggle for overthrowing the oppressors, but to practice reconciliation. For instance, when, in the Revolution of 1917, the questions of the real meaning of the role of the state arose all in its vastness as a practical question demanding immediate action on a wide mass scale, all the socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks suddenly and completely sank into the petty bourgeois theory of reconciliation of the classes by the state. Innumerable resolutions and articles by politicians of both these parties are saturated through and through with this purely petty bourgeois and Philistine theory of reconciliation, that the state is an organ of domination of a definite class which cannot be reconciled with its antipode, the class opposed to it, this petty bourgeois democracy is never able to understand. Its attitude towards the state is one of the most telling proofs that our socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks are not socialists at all, which we Bolsheviks have always maintained, but petty bourgeois democrats with a near-socialist phraseology. On the other hand, the Kotskyist distortion of Marx is far more subtle. Theoretically, there is no denying that the state is the organ of class domination, or that class antagonisms are irreconcilable. But what is forgotten or glossed over is this. If the state is the product of the irreconcilable character of class antagonisms, if it is a force standing above society and increasingly separating itself from it, then it is clear that the liberation of the oppressed class is impossible, not only without a violent revolution, but also without the destruction of the apparatus of state power, which was created by the ruling class and in which this separation is embodied. As we shall see later, Marx drew this theoretically self-evident conclusion from a concrete historical analysis of the problems of revolution, and it is exactly this conclusion which Kotsky, as we shall show fully in our subsequent remarks, has forgotten and distorted. Section 2. Special Bodies of Armed Men, Prisons, etc. Engels continues. In contrast with the ancient organization of the gens, the first distinguishing characteristic of the state is the grouping of the subjects of the state on a territorial basis. Such a grouping seems natural to us, but it came after a prolonged and costly struggle against the old form of tribal or gentilic society. Engels continues, the second is the establishment of a public force, which is no longer absolutely identical with the population organizing itself as an armed power. This special public force is necessary, because a self-acting armed organization of the population has become impossible since the cleavage of society into classes. This public force exists in every state. It consists not merely of armed men, but of material appendages, prisons, and repressive institutions of all kinds, of which gentilic society knew nothing. Engels develops the conception of that power which is termed the state, a power arising from society but placing itself above it and becoming more and more separated from it. What does this power mainly consist of? It consists of special bodies of armed men who have at their disposal prisons, etc. We are justified in speaking of special bodies of armed men because the public power peculiar to every state is not absolutely identical with the armed population, with its self-acting armed organization. Like all the great revolutionary thinkers, Engels tries to draw the attention of the class-conscious workers to that very fact which, to all prevailing Philistinism, appears least of all worthy of attention, most common and sanctified by solid, indeed one might say petrified, prejudices. A standing army of police are the chief instruments of state power. But can this be otherwise? From the point of view of the vast majority of Europeans at the end of the 19th century whom Engels was addressing, and who had neither lived through nor closely observed a single great revolution, this cannot be otherwise. They cannot understand at all what this self-acting, armed organization of the population means. To the question, whence arose the need for special bodies of armed men, standing above society and becoming separated from it, police and standing army, the Western and European and Russian Philistines are inclined to answer with few phrases borrowed from Spencer or Mikhailovsky by reference to the complexity of social life, the differentiation of functions, and so forth. Such a reference seems scientific and effectively dulls the senses of the average man, obscuring the most important and basic fact, namely, the breakup of society into irreconcilably antagonistic classes. Without such a breakup, the self-acting armed organization of the population might have differed from the primitive organization of a herd of monkeys grasping sticks, or of primitive men, or men united in a tribal form of society by its complexity, its high technique, and so forth, but would still have been possible. It is impossible now because society in the period of civilization is broken up into antagonistic and indeed irreconcilably antagonistic classes, which, if armed in a self-acting manner, would come into armed struggle with one another. A state is formed 
end, a special power is created in the form of special bodies of armed men, and every revolution, by shattering the state apparatus, demonstrates to us how the ruling class aims at the restoration of special bodies of armed men at its service, and how the oppressed class tries to create a new organization of this kind, capable of serving not the exploiters, but the exploited. In the above observation, Engels raises theoretically the same question which every great revolution raises practically, palpably, and on a mass scale of action, namely, the question of the relation between the special bodies of armed men and the self-acting armed organization of the population. And we shall see now that this is concretely illustrated by the experience of the European and Russian revolutions. But let us return to Engels' discourse. He points out sometimes, for instance, here and there in North America, this public power is weak. He has in mind an exception that is rare in capitalist society, and he speaks about parts of North America in its pre-imperialist days, where the free colonists predominated. But in general, it tends to become stronger. So, Engels says... It, the public power, grows stronger. However, in proportion as the class antagonisms within the state grow sharper and with the growth and size of the population of the adjacent states. We have only to look at our present-day Europe, where class struggle and rivalry and conquest have screwed up the public power to such a pitch that it threatens to devour the whole of society and even the state itself. This was written as early as the beginning of the 1890s, Engels' last preface being dated June 16th, 1891. The turn towards imperialism, understood to mean the complete domination of the trust, full sway of the large banks, and a colonial policy on a grand scale and so forth, was only beginning in France, and was even weaker in North America and Germany. Since then, the rivalry and conquest has made gigantic progress, especially as, by the beginning of the second decade of the 20th century, the whole world had been divided up between these rivals and conquest, that is, between the great predatory powers. Military and naval armaments since then have grown to monstrous proportions, and the predatory war of 1914 through 1917 for the domination of the world by England or Germany, for the division of the spoils, has brought the swallowing up of all the forces of society by the rapacious state power nearer to a complete catastrophe. As early as 1891, Engels was able to point to the rivalry and conquest as one of the most important features of the foreign policy of the great powers, but in 1914 through 1917, when this rivalry, many times intensified, had given birth to an imperialist war, the rascally social chauvinists cover up their defense of the predatory policy of their capitalist classes by phrases about the defense of the fatherland, or the defense of the republic and the revolution, etc. Section 3, the state as an instrument for the exploitation of the oppressed class. For the maintenance of a public special force standing above society, taxes and state loans are needed. Engels continues, having at their disposal the public force and the right to exact taxes, the officials now stand as organs of society above society. The free voluntary respect which was accorded to the organs of the gentilic form of government does not satisfy them, even if they could have it. Special laws are enacted regarding the sanctity of the inviolability of the officials. The shabbiest police servant has more authority than the representative of the clan, but even the head of the military power of a civilized state may well envy the least among the chiefs of the clan of the unconstrained and uncontested respect which is paid to him. Here the questions regarding the privileged position of the officials as organs of the state power is clearly stated. The main point is indicated as follows. What is it that places them above society? We shall see how this theoretical problem was solved in practice by the Paris Commune in 1871, and how it was slurred over in a reactionary manner by Kotsky in 1912. As the state arose out of the need to hold class antagonisms in check, but as it at the same time arose in the midst of the conflict of these classes, it is, as a rule, the state of the most powerful economically dominant class, which, by virtue thereof, becomes also the dominant class politically, and thus acquires new means of holding down and exploiting the oppressed class. Not only in the ancient and feudal states were organs of exploitations of the slaves and serfs, but the modern representative state is the instrument of the exploitation of wage labor by capital. By way of exception, however, there are periods when the warring classes so nearly attain equilibrium that the state power ostensibly appearing as a mediator assumes for the moment a certain independence in relation to both. Such were, for instance, the absolute monarchists of the 17th and 18th century, the Bonapartism of the First and Second Empires in France, and the Bismarck regime in Germany. Such, we may add, is now the Kerensky government in Republican Russia after its shift to persecuting the revolutionary proletariat at a moment when the Soviets, thanks to the leadership of the petty bourgeois democrats, have already become impotent while the bourgeoisie is not yet strong enough to disperse them outright. 
In a democratic republic, Engels continues, wealth wields its power indirectly, but all the more effectively. First, by means of direct corruption of the officials, America. Second, by means of the alliance of the government with the stock exchange, France and America. At the present time, imperialism and the domination of the banks have developed to an unusually fine art, both these methods of defending and asserting the omnipotence of wealth in democratic republics of all descriptions. If, for instance, in the very first months of the Russian Democratic Republic, one might say during the honeymoon of the union of the, quote, socialists, unquote, that is, the socialist revolutionaries in the Mensheviks honeymoon with the bourgeoisie, Mr. Pelshinsky obstructed every measure in the coalition cabinet, restraining the capitalists and the war profiteering, their plundering of the public treasury by means of army contracts, and if, after his resignation, Mr. Pelshinsky, replaced, of course, by an exactly similar dude, was rewarded by the capitalists with a soft job carrying a salary of 120,000 rubles per annum, what was this? Was this direct or indirect bribery? A league of the government with capitalist syndicates or only friendly relations? What is the role played by the Chernovs, etc.? Are they the direct or only the indirect allies of the millionaire treasury looters? The omnipotence of wealth is thus more secure in a democratic republic, since it does not depend on the poor political shell of capitalism. A democratic republic is the best possible political shell for capitalism, and therefore, once capital has gained control through the Polshinsky, Chernov, Stratelis, and company, of this very best shell, it establishes its power so securely, so firmly, that no change, either of persons or institutions or parties in the bourgeois republic, can shake it. We must also note that Engels quite definitely regards universal suffrage as a means of bourgeois domination. Universal suffrage, he says, obviously summing up the long experience of German social democracy, is an index of the maturity of the working class. It cannot and never will be anything else but that in the modern state. The petty bourgeois democrats, such as our social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, and their twin brothers, the social chauvinists and opportunists of Western Europe, all expect more from universal suffrage. They themselves share, and instill into the minds of the people, the wrong idea that universal suffrage in the modern state is really capable of expressing the will of the majority of the toilers and assuring its realization. We can here only note this wrong idea, only point out that this perfectly clear, exact and concrete statement by Engels is distorted at every step in the propaganda and agitation of the official, i.e. the opportunist, socialist parties. A detailed analysis of all the falseness of this idea, which Engels brushes aside, is given in our further account of the views of Marx and Engels on the modern state. A general summary of his views is given by Engels in the most popular of his works in the following words. The state, therefore, has not existed from all eternity. There have been societies which managed without it, which had no conception of the state and state power. At a certain stage of economic development, which was necessarily bound up with the cleavage of society into classes, the state became a necessity owing to this cleavage. We are now rapidly approaching a stage in the development of production at which the existence of these classes has not only ceased to be a necessity, but is becoming a positive hindrance to production. They will disappear as inevitably as they arose at an earlier stage. Along with them, the state will inevitably disappear. The society that organizes the production anew on the basis of a free and equal association of the producers will put the whole state machine where it will then belong, in the Museum of Antiquities, side by side with the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. It is not often that we find this passage quoted in the propaganda and agitation literature of contemporary social democracy, but even when we do come across it, it is generally quoted in the same manner as one bows before an icon, i.e., it is done merely to show official respect to angles without any attempt to gauge the breadth and depth of revolutionary action presupposed by this regulating of the whole state machine to the Museum of Antiquities. In most cases, we do not even find an understanding of what Engels calls the state machine. Section 4. The Withering Away of the State and Violent Revolution Engels' words regarding the withering away of the state enjoy such popularity, they are so often quoted, and they show so clearly the essence of the usual adulteration by means of which Marxism is made to look like opportunism, that we must dwell on them in detail. Let us quote the whole passage from which they are taken. The proletariat seizes power and then transforms the means of production into state property. But in doing this, it puts an end to itself as the proletariat. It puts an end to all class differences and class antagonisms. It puts an end also to the state as the state. 
former society moving in class antagonisms had need of the state, that is, an organization of the exploiting class at each period for the maintenance of its external conditions of production, therefore, in particular, for the forcible holding down of the exploited class in the conditions of oppression, slavery, bondage or serfdom, wage labor, determined by the existing mode of production. The state was the official representative of society as a whole, its embodiment in a visible corporate body, but it was this only in so far as it was the state of that class which itself, in its epoch, represented society as a whole, in ancient times the state of the slave-owning citizens, in middle ages of the feudal nobility, in our epoch of the bourgeoisie, when ultimately it becomes really representative of society as a whole, it makes itself superfluous. As soon as there is no longer any class of society to be held in subjugation, as soon as, along with class domination and the struggle for individual existence based on the former anarchy of production, the collisions and exercises arising from these have also been abolished, there is nothing more to be repressed, and a special repressive force, a state, is no longer necessary. Necessary. The first act in which the state really comes forward as the representative of society as a whole, the seizure of the means of production in the name of society, is at the same time its last dependent act as a state. The interference of a state power in social relations becomes superfluous in one sphere after another, and then becomes dormant of itself. Government over persons is replaced by the administration of things and the direction of the processes of production. The state is not abolished, it withers away. It is from this standpoint that we must appraise the phrase people's free state, both its justification at times for agitational purposes and its ultimate scientific inadequacy, and also the demand of the so-called anarchists that the state should be abolished overnight. Friedrich Engels, Anti-During. Without fear of committing an error, it may be said that of this argument by Engels so singularly rich in ideas, only one point has become an integral part of socialist thought among modern socialist parties, namely that, unlike the anarchist doctrine of the abolition of the state, according to Marx, the state withers away. To emasculate Marxism in such a manner as to reduce it to opportunism, for such an interpretation only leaves the hazy conception of a slow, even gradual change, free from leaps and storms, free from revolution. The current popular conception, if one may say so, of the withering away of the state undoubtedly means a slurring over, if not a negation, of revolution. Yet such an interpretation is the crudest distortion of Marxism, which is advantageous only to the bourgeoisie. In point of theory, it is based on a disregard for the most important circumstances and considerations pointed out in the very passage summarizing Engels' ideas, which we have just quoted in full. In the first place, Engels at the very outset of his argument says that, in assuming state power, the proletariat by the very act puts an end to the state as the state. One is not accustomed to reflect on what this really means. Generally, it is either ignored altogether, or it is considered as a piece of Hegelian weakness on Engels' part. As a matter of fact, however, these words express succinctly the experience of one of the greatest proletarian revolutions, the Paris Commune of 1871, of which we shall speak in greater detail in its proper place. As a matter of fact, Engels speaks here of the destruction of the bourgeois state by the proletarian revolution, while the words about its withering away refer to the remains of proletarian statehood after the socialist revolution. The bourgeois state does not wither away, according to Engels, but it is put an end to by the proletariat in the course of revolution. What withers away after the revolution is the proletarian state, or the semi-state. Secondly, the state is a special repressive force. The splendid and extremely profound definition of Engels is given by him here with complete lucidity. It follows from the point that the special repressive force of the bourgeoisie for the suppression of the proletariat of the millions of workers by a handful of the rich must be replaced by a special repressive force of the proletariat for the suppression of the bourgeoisie, the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is just this that constitutes the destruction of the state as the state. It is just this that constitutes the act of the seizure of the means of production in the name of society. And it is obvious that such a substitution of one proletarian special repressive force for another bourgeois special repressive force can in no way take place in the form of a withering away. Thirdly, as to the withering away, or more expressively and colorfully, 
as to the state becoming dormant, Engels refers quite clearly and definitely to the period after the seizure of the means of production by the state in the name of society. That is, after the socialist revolution. We all know that the political form of the state at the time is complete democracy, but it never enters the head of any of the opportunists who shamelessly distort Marx that when Engels speaks here of the state withering away or becoming dormant, he speaks of democracy. At first sight, this seems very strange, but it is unintelligible only to one who has not reflected on the fact that democracy is also a state and that consequently democracy will also disappear when the state disappears. The bourgeois state can only be put an end to by a revolution. The state in general, i.e. the most complete democracy, can only wither away. Fourthly, having formulated his famous proposition that the state withers away, Engels at once explains concretely that this proposition is directed equally against the opportunists and the anarchists. In doing this, however, Engels puts in the first place that conclusion from his proposition about the withering away of the state which is directed against the opportunists. One can wager that out of every 10,000 persons who have read or heard about the withering away of the state, 9,990 do not know at all or do not remember that Engels did not direct his conclusion from this proposition against the anarchists alone. And out of the remaining 10, probably 9 do not know the meaning of people's free state, nor the reason why an attack on this watchword contains an attack on the opportunists. This is how history is written. This is how a great revolutionary doctrine is imperceptibly adulterated and adapted to current Philistinism. The conclusion drawn against the anarchists has been repeated thousands of times, vulgarized, harangued about in the crudest fashion possible until it has acquired the strength of a prejudice, whereas the conclusion drawn against the opportunist has been hushed up and forgotten. The people's free state was a demand in the program of the German Social Democrats and their slogan in the 70s. There is no political substance in this slogan other than a pompous middle class circumlocution of the idea of democracy. Insofar as it is referred to in a lawful manner to a democratic republic, Engels was prepared to justify its use at times from a propaganda point of view, but this slogan was opportunist, for it not only expressed an exaggerated view of the attractiveness of bourgeois democracy, but also a lack of understanding of the socialist criticism of every state in general. We are in favor of a democratic republic as the best form of the state for the proletarian under capitalism, but we have no right to forget that wage slavery is the lot of the people even in the most democratic bourgeois republic. Furthermore, every state is a special repressive force of the suppression of the oppressed class. Consequently, no state is either free or a people state. Marx and Engels explain this repeatedly to their party comrades in the 70s. Fifthly, in the same work of Engels from which everyone remembers his argument on the withering away of the state, there is also a disquisition on the significance of a violent revolution. The historical analysis of its role becomes, with Engels, a veritable panegyric on violent revolution. This, of course, no one remembers. To talk or even to think of the importance of this idea is not considered good form by contemporary socialist parties, and in the daily propaganda and agitation among the masses, it plays no part whatever. Yet, it is indissolubly bound up with the withering away of the state in one harmonious whole. Here's Engel's argument. That force, however, plays another role, other than that of a diabolical power in history, a revolutionary role. That, in the words of Marx, it is the midwife of every old society which is pregnant with the new. That it is the instrument with whose aid social movement forces its way through and shatters the dead fossilized political forms. Of this there is not a word in air during. It is only with sighs and groans that he admits the possibility that force will perhaps be necessary for the overthrow of the economic system of exploitation. Unfortunately, because all use of force, forsooth, demoralizes the person who uses it, and this in spite of the immense moral and spiritual impetus which has resulted from every victorious revolution, and this in Germany, where a violent collision, which indeed may be forced on the people, would at least have the advantage of wiping out the servility which has permitted the national consciousness as a result of the humiliation of the Thirty Years' War. And this Parsons mode of thought, lifeless, insipid, impotent, claims to impose itself on the most revolutionary party which history has known. How can this panegyric on violent revolution which Engels insistently brought to the attention of the German Social Democrats between 1878 and 1984, that is, right to the time of his death, be combined with the theory of the withering away of the state to form one doctrine? 
Usually the two views are combined by means of eclecticism, by an unprincipled, sophistic, arbitrary selection to oblige the powers that be of either one or the other argument, and in 99 cases out of 100, if not more often, it is the idea of the withering away that is specially emphasized. Eclecticism is substituted for dialectics. This is the most usual, the most widespread phenomenon to be met with the official social democratic literature of our day in relation to Marxism. Such a substitution is, of course, nothing new, and may be observed even in history of classic Greek philosophy. When Marxism is adulterated to become opportunism, the substitution of eclecticism for dialectics is the best method of deceiving the masses. It gives an illusory satisfaction. It seems to take into account all sides of the process and the tendencies of development, all the contradictory factors and so forth, whereas in reality it offers no consistent revolutionary view of the process of social development at all. We have already seen that above, and shall show more fully later, that the teaching of Marx and Engels regarding the inevitability of a violent revolution refers to the bourgeois state. It cannot be replaced by the proletarian state, the dictatorship of the proletariat, through withering away, but, as a general rule, only through a violent revolution. The panegyric sung in its honor by Engels, and fully corresponding to the repeated declaration of Marx, remember the concluding passage of the Poverty of Philosophy in the Communist Manifesto with its proud and open declaration of the inevitability of violent revolution. Remember Marx's critique of the Gotha program in 1875 in which, almost 30 years later, he mercilessly castigates the opportunist character of that program. This praise is by no means a mere impulse, a mere declamation, nor is it a polemical sally. The necessity of systematically fostering among the masses this and just this point of view about violent revolution lies at the root of the whole of Marx and Engels' teaching. The neglect of such propaganda and agitation by both the present predominant social chauvinist and the Kotskyist currents brings the betrayal of Marx and Engels' teaching to a prominent relief. The replacement of the bourgeois by the proletarian state is impossible without a violent revolution. The abolition of the proletarian state, i.e. of all states, is only possible through withering away. Marx and Engels gave a full and concrete exposition of these views in studying each revolutionary situation separately, in analyzing the lessons of the experience of each individual revolution. We now pass to this, undoubtedly the most important part of their work.